Welcome. Um, my name is Henning Pizunker. I'm an assistant professor in the entrepreneurship department. What you're actually going to see is actually one of the classes I'm teaching. So for the students who are here, now you can't really get up. You're going to see this again on Tuesday. So besides actually having a presentation, what you're going to see is actually how an MBA class looks basically these days. So whether the slides have changed or whether these are still kind of 20, 30 years old. Um, first thing, other thing which is worth pointing out, there are more people in the room than for Randy Commissar. <laughs> so what I would like to, I, what I would like, and uh, what I really enjoyed was actually that innovation really comes kind of from all these different spaces. It's kind of unclear where ideas pop up, and so I would like to talk actually about the crowdsourcing of innovation. And to talk a little bit about this, I would like to take us a long way back actually to the succession in Spain, where actually King Louis XIV um, of France proclaimed Philip um, to be king of Spain. And at the time, Britain cared much more about the European Union than they do nowadays, and they actually started intervening. So you see here, they're coming all the way down and start engaging at this fight. It's actually not working particularly well. And so at some point, they then start returning. And this is actually where everything comes down. So the problem they are encountering is the skilling, or what happens is the skilling naval disaster in 1707. And the problem is they think they are basically very close to Shan. Where they actually are is that they are very close to Skilly. So they're actually 114 miles off. And as you can imagine, if you go into like a small island group, a real drama really happens, right? So <coughs> the ships actually all think there are 2,000 deaths, 13 survivors. The whole fleet is basically dying. And the shock is obviously enormously big. So let's have a look at how this happens. At the time, ships were actually navigating by a technique which is called dead reckoning. And in many ways, this is fantastic. So you go, actually, you start at 9 AM, you go in a certain direction, you do a course change of 30%, and then you have no course change, you keep on going. And at the beginning, this is all fine. You go along the coastline, you have very precise map. <coughs> You have a chip log which actually tracks how long you go. You make a change right, with your compass. And you use the sun and the star dial to actually figure out where you are. There's a bit of a problem about this. You have a cumulative measurement error. right? You have 5% off on the map, 5% off on the chip log, 5% off on the sundial, And pretty quickly, you are kind of in the C minus or D range. So the thing about navigation on the sea is that it's fairly easy actually to determine latitude. It's incredibly hard to determine longitude. And people have tried this in, ma in many different ways. So they focused actually on figuring out the exact distance celestial bodies as a reference. But that's actually very difficult on a moving ship. So people came up with all these crazy devices. But you see, this is on the sea. right? It's a ship which is moving. So this is actually enormously hard to pull off. Galileo Galilei actually <coughs> came up with this weirdo helmet to, to say, OK, maybe we can use that to determine it. Right? Here's actually like a, um, an observation platform to put on a ship. But as you can imagine, right, this is basically this, the early days of the 18th century. It's very difficult to put such a thing on a ship. And so basically a little bit desperate, England has the idea, OK, we are going to ask everyone we can imagine. And they actually released the so-called Longitude Act. And the idea of the Longitude Act is basically it's one of the first documented innovation prizes where we say, can anyone actually help us to put this into place to actually measure or navigate on a ship? So there's the Board of Longitude. Very prominent individual, Sir Isaac Newton, for example, is on. And they provide prices. So for example, 10,000 pounds. And these prices, what I find most interesting about them is really how low the standards are at the time. Right? You get 10,000 pounds if, if you can make a lot within 16 nautic miles. In today's money, that's still actually very significant. Right? You, get two million, you get 2 million US dollars if you're within 16 nautic miles. And then it obviously goes up the closer you come. But the ambition is still very low, as you can see. Right? Nobody actually expects you. You see, nowadays, I'm like offended when my Google Maps actually puts me like um, in the wrong street, basically. Oh, I would have needed to take the next one the right. right? We are talking here about miles difference. And you can still earn millions with it. 
So all you basically need to do actually to, to find out where you are is actually to find this, uh, to have the exact time. <coughs> because you can use the Earth rotation and then with, by, by <coughs> knowing where the sun sits, you can figure out the problem about it is, is well, Gilbert nowadays might actually have his mobile phone when he checks the time in my class. On the ship, he had no mobile phone, right, basically, right? This is the early 18th century. It's not 2004. So you need to find a way to determine the time. And the person who actually takes this on is John Harrison, a self-educated English carpenter and clockmaker. And he thinks about this idea, oh, you know, these pendulum clocks are not going to work on a ship. So what I'm actually going to do is that I'll take a spring-loaded clock. Isaac Newton thinks this is a horrible idea. He's not believing in it. Even when he sees proof of concept, he's still arguing against it. At the end, the innovation actually prevails and comes through. And what I really like about the story is right, that it really shows that this character of John Harrison and, and self-educated carpenter right, who would have never kind of hired to solve this problem, nobody would have thought of him and said, like, hey, we should ask John Harrison about this, actually has the idea. Nobody knew about him. And as you can see, this strategy, what has been done by the Board of Longitude in the 18th century, is done nowadays. Netflix has no idea how to improve its recommendation system. And so they go for, they go for this one million fund where they basically say, if you have any idea how to improve this, please send us us. And obviously, we have all kinds of innovations coming from Netflix nowadays, right? Based with- You want to know what takes real courage? Holding it all together when the stakes are this high. So they're kind of continuing innovating also something where they actually use crowds to identify what kind of movies they should kind of produce and help to develop. It's not only high-tech firms which actually do this. Look at Starbucks. If you ever wondered where are all these drinks coming from, right? Who actually can differentiate the cinnamon dolce latte from an iced caramel macchiato? I know some of you like I can, yes. <laughs> So how do you even come up with all of this? The answer is actually very, very straightforward. You come up with all of this. Stan, um, Starbucks actually has a suggestion system where people have suggested 46,709 uh, coffee and espresso drinks. Okay? This does not include the frappuccinos and beverages. <laughs> okay? So people are very, very creative when it comes to kind of creating new types of coffee. And Starbucks collects this. But uh, there's also other kinds of kind of ideas you have. Some of you might remember this, um, <coughs> the Deepwater Horizon accident, where, where we had this drill basically kind of being destroyed. You see, normally when I show this picture, everybody's like, Oh my God, these days in France I get this phrase, oh, where do I get all this kind of fuel for my car? <laughs> <laughs> so for God's sake, they even, uh, you know, even Kevin Costner has an idea to kind of how to solve this problem. <laughs> so they actually crowdsource 120,000 suggestions. Okay, 120,000 suggestions came in actually to make this. It was a huge mess. Nobody knew how to process this. BP had never, a, a, besides the kind of deep water horizon itself, they'd never engaged in the process on how to figure this out. Um, <coughs> but it shows kind of how willing the public really is to help, right? Think about it, 120,000 suggestions. So nowadays we have all these kind of crowd elements, right? I looked up all kinds of speakers we have nowadays are either invested in a crowdfunding, are called kind of crowd. So we have all kinds of crowd elements here, co-creation, peer-to-peer, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of this whole kind of crowd-driven enterprise that actually focus on crowdsourcing innovation. How can we find someone who has a good idea who helps me to solve a particular problem or to identify a particular problem? One question is why this actually works. And this brings us a little bit back to Austrian economics. Practically, my Friedrich August Hyatt, the practically every individual has some advantage over all others because he possesses unique information of which beneficial <coughs> use might be made, but of which use can be made only if the decision depending on it are left to him or are made with his active cooperation. I always find there's an incredible beauty in this statement because it really shows that every individual of us actually has a very specific kind of piece of information which might be helpful to find a particular, to find a particular solution to a problem. 
So kind of going back to Randy's talk, I would actually say the role of minimal invasive surgeries is actually to make that blossom and actually to get that out. We all remember kind of Benedict Cumberbatch, right? Alan Turing is very much a guy who had like very little actually going for him in many ways, right? Was excluded out of society because of, of his homosexuality, but actually had this particular skill. Joanne Clark as well, also part of the team which actually helped to develop the Enigma machine and saved thousands if not millions of lives by helping to end the Second World War earlier than it did. And Alan Turing said himself, sometimes it is the people who no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. CEOs have picked up on this. It's no longer individuals toiling in a laboratory coming up with some great invention. It's not an individual. It's individuals, it's multidisciplinary. It's global, it's collaborative. So how does this actually look like? How has innovation changed over the time? So we started out here in the 1880s and look here at the key charges and the interaction between the different participants. Originally, we had Thomas Edison who kind of, we think of him as an individual great inventor. That's actually not totally true, but let's kind of stay with this cliche for a second. We then have here more corporate innovation. Since the 1990s, we are entering much more the idea of open innovation. And this is a significant change. It used to be that R&D labs are really like castles on the hill, right? These are actual kind of R&D labs pictured here. We're like, okay, nobody's gonna come in here. Nothing we have in here is gonna go out. So the closed innovation model, what you basically do, you have a couple of projects, um, then you filter them and they run through and some kind of explode and some eventually make it. But an open innovation model is fundamentally different. So Henry Chesbarrow, um, at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley points this out a paradigm that assumes that firms can and should use external ideas as well as internal ideas and internal and external pathways to market as they look to advance their technology. So this is a mouthful. How does this actually look like? So we now have these projects here. <coughs> but one of the things which is actually an important difference, and Dietmar Haaf is actually pointing this out in a very nice way in his research. He's sitting right there in the back is that we actually focus very often too much on actually big systems and not so much on the teams and individuals. But all these ideas are actually carried around by individuals. And so it's very often much more important to get these ideas across people. One of the people I, I most admire in life, by the way, Henrik Graver's dissertation advisor. Um, I could have said I admire Henrik Graver, it's just even, even more. So does it concern you that people sometimes, <laughs> sometimes misunderstand your ideas? In a real sense, there's no such thing as my ideas. Scholarship and notions of intellectual property are poor bad maps, bad mates. I've often read things both by critics and by enthusiasts that seem to be, to be based on a less than precise reading of what I've written. But once you publish something, you lose special access to it. The interpretations of others have as much legitimacy if they can be defended as yours do. In the best of all worlds, others will generate interpretations that are more interesting than the ones you had in mind. In fact, a basic goal in writing is to choose words that can evoke beautiful and useful meanings that were not explicit in your own mind. Right? And that very much captures the idea of open innovation. You need to make these ideas actually transfer. You need to make them flow because other people will interpret it. Other people who are smarter than you, who are not working for your companies, will find ways to actually make more out of these ideas. The question is, how do you find these people? <coughs> you cannot simply hunt them down. The only way to find the smartest people in the world is to let them find you, to create a platform so that ma people are magnetically attracted to you. One of the reasons why the individuals are so powerful these days is because they have been empowered. Think about what has changed. This used to be telecommunication. This used to be telecommunication like six, seven years ago. This is much more communication nowadays. We all have a supercomputer in our pocket, right? We have motion sensors in our homes. This has all been commoditized. It's incredibly cheap. We have 3D printers. We can actually do very quickly, very easily rapid prototyping. So it's not just that the individuals hold these ideas, but the individuals can actually go a very long way towards a solution, they are embedded in maker communities where they can actually, so all you really want to do is to tap into this potential. So this is the academic talks. So I'm gonna point a couple of scientific papers out here. 
People have actually shown, a wonderful paper by Four and Tucci, show that this, when this can actually <coughs> create value. Lars von Jeppesen and Karim Lakani actually looked at innocent, you know, like the competitions at Innocentive and figure, actually figured out that very often it's kind of marginal players who are not part of the community, so we're not kind of talking to on an, uh, on an a daily basis, actually have these ideas we are going for. Eric von Hippel, a little bit kind of almost the godfather of this kind of area, has really shown the power of individuals in that. Mark Ruber, by the way, did my house, um, doctoral student a long, long time ago, um, showed a wonderful paper how individuals play a key role in identifying new technology markets, new markets for technology. Another paper by Dittmar and Eric. So, but <coughs> besides these scientific papers, I would like to illustrate this with a recent example by Colgate. Who has ever used Colgate here? All right. So Colgate is an incredibly big company, obviously, right? It has like 40,000 employees, has a ton of revenue. But then they had an enormous big problem. How, do, how to get chloric powder into toothpaste tubes without disturbing it into the atmosphere? So this is not an easy problem, right? The problem about, the bigger problem about this problem is I do not know how to solve it. Who do I call to solve this problem, right? It's not as if I open up the yellow pages and say like, hey, how do I get this thing kind of, how do I get this powder without dispersing it into the atmosphere? Is there a chemical solution? Is there a physical solution, a biological solution, or an IT solution? Nobody really knew. How do you do this? They actually did a crowdsourcing competition. So this all didn't work. This is what they wanted to achieve, but it didn't fly. And then actually a physicist had actually said, retired physicist had seen the problem. He said like, oh, all you need to do is to put positive charge to fluoride and then you can <coughs> ground it in the tube. And that's a very easy thing actually to do. And this is actually, if you brushed your teeth this morning, I hope you did, that is actually how this got in there. People have very often simply different approaches. So this is the famous Yale tale, the discovery of the, I leave the reading to you, um, the skull was found by a Yale undergrad, Mark Solomon, while working with the Yale GPS expedition in Pakistan. Being relatively inexperienced at fossil collecting, he insisted on looking in ridiculous places that more knowledgeable members of the expedition told him were useless for fossils. In this way, he found what is arguably the most important specimen to come from the region, from the regiment from the region. So you see, it's not just that I have a particular kind of set of skills, I also have a particular kind of approach. I might have my way of looking for it, you might have a totally different way of looking for it, and I am not necessarily tolerant of your way looking and vice versa. But actually by enabling anyone to look in their way, you can actually kind of get something out of this. So what we've learned so far is that individuals are unknown to the organization that have unique knowledge. And organizations need to find these individuals. And so the big question is obviously how. I would like to emphasize that I had a young boy for the why, and now when it comes to the practical stuff, I actually have a young girl who figures out the how. <laughs> right? So IKEA is not going to provide the solution. Hopefully a paper I've written together with Linus Dalanda and Lars von Jeppesen does. Um, this picture actually gives you kind of a good role distribution in the, in the co-author team, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I'll let you guess who that is. So how can organizations tap into the potential of leveraging the idea? What I would like to do, and I'm very aware that you cannot remember all of this, I do not have the advantage I have in class that I could say like, there's gonna be a survey in the end, okay? <laughs> um, what I'm gonna do here is that um, if you're on the attendance list, um, I'm gonna kind of send a summary of this to you so that you take something away. Um, feel free still to take some notes. It kind of makes me feel good. You know, you can also just move your pen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are four phases, and I'm going to lead you quickly through those. It's basically you define, you broadcast, you attract, and you select. Okay. So, simply speaking, DBAS or DBAS or whatever. So if you wonder how I'm going to talk about it, right? I could very talk deeply about one particular category or I talk much more broadly about it, um, this talk is clearly gonna ear on the side of breath. I'm gonna talk about everything a little bit to have you an overview, and if you want to, afterwards we can go into more detail um, on the specific issues. So the first question you have to ask yourself, do you look for problem or solution-related knowledge, right? 
So Kolkata, they actually knew their problem. They had their problem exactly down. They knew what they wanted to achieve. They just needed someone who could actually help do it. Starbucks actually knows the solutions. They know how to do a drink. What they do not know is the problem. Which kind of drink should they do? So Starbucks is actually looking for problem-related knowledge. Another question you need to ask is the specificity of the task. Very often, you can actually specify a task very, very narrowly. You can be like super specific, or you can be very broad. I can tell you how this worked for me when I actually um, <coughs> looked at different business schools. So here's how the teaching instruction to new professors work, all right? At some business schools, this is how this is going to look like. Teach the following cases. You use the board, but no PowerPoint. That's actually true for a school Randy has talked quite a bit about this morning, <laughs> where he has an argument with the dean. Always wear a suit, not a tie. All right, I'm fit it's not a suit. I'm fitting the no tie thing. Take your jacket off in the beginning and then roll up your sleeves. <laughs> right. All my tattoos would be visible. So, at Intel is a little bit different. Phil Angersner from the entrepreneurship class came to me from the entrepreneurship came to me and said, "Like, hey, this is going to be very easy. Just be a world class teacher. That is all what you need to do. Okay, the rest I leave up to you. Okay, um, we actually know how this works for Intel." So another thing you can actually do, as you discuss problems or as you kind of state problems, you can decompose them, right, what you see here, or you can aggregate them. So let me go to the DARPA challenges, which is one of the big drivers, actually, of, of the autonomous car. One of you actually had a question about the autonomous car this morning. You could <coughs> actually do this very decomposed, right? You could say, I'm looking for a laser sensor, I'm looking for proximity sensors, visual sensors, a car, a powerful computer, program to life take instructions an AI to combine something with that. So you really kind of decompose it, modularize it, look for every single component. The other thing you could do is, uh, you know, we're just looking for an autonomous car which can drive th through a desert. The advantage of the aggregated is obviously, and this is super, super key, you can actually account for interdependencies, right? The laser I use is not independent of the software. The sensors I use is not necessarily independent of the tires and so Right? So it's sometimes very difficult to decompose it. The problem about this is if you actually aggregate it, it's very, very costly for the participants. Right? If Andy Wu, for example, and I, we wanted to build a car together, right? if we just do a laser sensor, we could do this. Right? We could, for example, ask Gilad. Gilad is going to talk later. He knows a ton about sensors. And we could figure out the sensor. Actually, building the whole car is much more difficult. So the three of us might be very good in this kind of decomposed categories, but we might be at a total loss. So you kind of exclude certain people by that. So here it's low cost for participants. The problem about it is our laser might be the greatest laser ever, but it might not actually work well as part of an overall product. Right? It might be good as a local solution, but not actually help me to get a really functioning car. They chose the aggregated one. And what you see is they've become, these cars have become better and better and better over the time. And probably most important, this challenge has really kind of helped to kick off the whole industry of autonomous driving. Google then actually acquired one of the teams. And partially to this approach, we actually kind of talk now about when are we going to have self-driving cars. <coughs> Another thing, and you might now be thinking like that, OK, where do I get all these people from? right? Um, if I actually, Nima might say, okay, I have a great idea, I need help on this, but who am I gonna, who am I gonna engage on this? You can actually do this via intermediaries, or you can do it by your own initiative. If you do it via intermediaries, you have fantastic advantage. You immediately kind of, firms like Innocentive give you access to a diverse crowd, large crowds. They offer advice. It's not easy to run such a thing, all right? You actually, to actually set up a crowd, so it's a non-trivial thing to do. So they provide advice. Of course, you have no direct access to the participants, right? If I actually use Innocentive and you want to talk afterwards to one of them, Innocentive actually owns the person, so to speak. The other thing about it is it costs me a ton of money, actually. How do you choose between the two? So you really go, basically, for the intermediary if you need a lot of distant knowledge. If you need someone, basically, where you say, like, OK, nobody in our ecosystem has any clue about this, then you go to the intermediary. And when the organization doesn't have a strong brand. It's one thing for Google to make these challenges themselves. It's a very different thing for Henning Pisunka Inc. actually to run its own crowdsourcing. 
nobody shows up. My students don't even go on my own website, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's true, I tested that. <laughs> When organizations, yeah, yeah uh, some people are thinking Henning has a website. <laughs> <laughs> when organization wants to strengthen relationships with existing customers, right, you can give them the feeling, oh, you know, he really kind of integrating <coughs> us, he's listening to us, this is great. And another thing you can do is you do an open call or you just do it via invitation, right? So we started out with an open call where we said, like, everybody who uh, hears about this, it's a law, everybody can participate. This holds basically for, for the complete society, everybody jump in. The alternative is actually do some in-house crowdsourcing. You do not necessarily have to open it up. You can actually do it for a very specific internal audience. In-house crowdsourcing is a number of dimensions, is high motivation, better protection of confidential material from the competition, right? Somebody puts <coughs> a great idea on my website, everybody can actually steal it immediately, right? In-house, people also have a better understanding, obviously, of the internal <coughs> workflows, right? If you are working for Procter & Gamble, you already know the kind of ideas you can actually implement or you could not implement. You have no IP issues. The problem is the less diverse knowledge base, right? The moment I ask internally, I'm basically constrained to my employees. Having said this, there's this famous saying by Heinrich von Pira, the former CEO of Siemens, if Siemens only knew what Siemens knows, Right? Very often, these companies are so big, it's very hard, actually. It's a great thing if you can tap into the knowledge. When I have a statistical problem, and I have plenty, um, I know that somebody at INSEAD has the knowledge. The problem is I do not necessarily know who it is. Right? So in-house crowdsourcing can actually be a fantastic solution to that. There's cutting edge research on, on this very topic recently where people start actually looking into in-house crowdsourcing. A big question is actually, how big should actually the crowd size be? What is an, what is an optimal crowd size um, to run this? So you can have a small, you can have a small crowd, or you can have a large crowd. Our intuition would, of course, be, hey, we go for a large crowd, right? More people actually give us more ideas. That seems that seems to make us a lot of sense. So there's a problem. I would ask, I would like to ask Daniel. Daniel is a fantastic student from my class last year about this. How many hours of effort, Daniel, are you willing to invest in a crowd-based competition? The final price is one million US dollars, and there are only two people who are allowed to compete. Yeah, high number. High number, yeah. I can tell you it's pretty hard to get Daniel to do anything, all right? <laughs> so so this, is actually, this is actually working well. The problem about it is the moment I actually allow 20,000 people, Daniel is going to be a little bit more skeptical, right? The expected value has just gone down tremendously, in particular in your case, I'm sorry to say. Uh, <laughs> so now you might actually be unwilling to engage. Daniel is a fantastic student. If so, somebody of you is looking for a high potential MBA from inside, this is the man. <laughs> That's what I'm saying publicly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the problem is now, how do you actually attract these people, right? So what's actually the incentive type? Why should I help? And I've actually done some research on this with Linus Dalander. As you see, as these communities age, the <coughs> average number of suggestions go down all the time. And as you can see, we actually start very low. We already, these are month, right? So in my first month, I might actually get six ideas, and then it's gone down tremendously, right? This is even worse if you look across all kind of, this is the median, OK? So this is right half. So basically, most of these communities do not get any ideas, OK? Um, there are a couple of things. Um, so as every you see, all these consultancies always have the studies. Most people fail, but this is what you need to do if you want to succeed. This is one part of this. Okay, read my scientific paper if you want to know how you succeed on this. So obviously, there are different ways to provide motivation. Um, one is the butt kicking advice. If you want to learn more about this, take my class. It's Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> okay. I have an alternative way of doing this. I simply say class attendance is mandatory. Okay. So you can go for pecuniary or non-pecuniary advice, right? So think about it if you just do not provide any incentive. You see, here you have the inventor, John Wesley Hyatt. He was encouraged to develop a new substance after he saw an advertisement by a company offering 10,000 to the person who invented a usable substitute for ivory in billiard balls. Hyatt eventually succeeded by inventing celluloid, which seemed to be a perfect substitute for ivory, but finally decided to patent his innovation instead of submitting it to the tournament and collecting the prize. Right? Sometimes you might actually encourage innovation, but then do not necessarily benefit from it. 
right? So just be, you're basically saying, listen, this is a promising innovation area the moment you kind of put such a, put such a price out. People, however, are motivated, in fact, to contribute. When you've got it right, you see your, your protein moving and changing shape and your score rushes up, your own player name rushes up through the ranks and uh, yeah, your adrenaline starts. It's like being a scientist when you get a paper published. <laughs> that 10% of euphoria is supposed to take you through the 90% of banging your head against a brick wall. But... People put a huge amount of energy into um, playing games on computers, so I think projects like this can channel that energy into solving real-world problems, and uh, that's a way in which everyone can contribute that really hasn't been there before. Suzanne Helitsky and I'm an administrator in Manchester and my folding gaming name is also Suzanne. Hello, I'm Charlie. I'm a bench technician and in my spare time I play folding. I used to be number two in the world. My gaming tag is Charlie Fort's Conscience and I'm a member of the Contenders. It's essentially a 3D jigsaw puzzle. You're given a, a protein which comprises of a, a backbone and individual side chains and by moving these around changing the interactions, your score either goes up or down. I'm an administrative worker in the rehab team. I'm, I'm just answering telephones, uh, working on uh, bespoke computer programs, interacting with staff. It's very repetitive. When I go home, I become a different person. <laughs> I just like to measure myself against something and it's given me something that my everyday life hasn't given me it's is to just use abilities i didn't know i had for me it's a guilty pleasure and yet here i am involved in something that has real relevance in the scientific world it makes you feel very proud of what you do which is essentially a, a little hobby so you see how people are actually extremely willing to contribute right it gives them something they do not find in their lives, you can of course also provide incentives to people. So for example, Gold Corp actually found a very interesting one where the Gold Corp organization initiated a prize for finding a new target for gold drilling. It offered more than just rewards for good solutions. It actually announced to hire some of the top solvers to actually find a job. Right? Very often now Google actually recruits people who do very well in these kind of programming competitions like TopCone and so on. So there is actually long term incentives to actually contribute. I will say that there's also the danger that extrinsic motivation can actually crowd out intrinsic motivation. Right? You give someone a little bit of money and suddenly you think like, oh I'll do it for the money and then I'm not motivated anymore. However, um, research by Amazon have found that intrinsic motivation can be sustained in the presence of an extrinsic award as long as the prize is positioned not as the focus of the exercise but as an additional reward. Icing on the cake, experience six pots. This got me actually a great idea. <coughs> Dear Dean of INSEAD, I'm of course intrinsically motivated. Please do not worry that providing some more extrinsic motivation would crowd out my intrinsic motivation. It's going to be just fine. All right? People are also going for attention, actually. So before I make my decision, I'd like to ask for your opinions. It's supposed to make you feel engaged, and you actually plan to listen to us. I'm hoping it will look that way on the outside. <laughs> attention is one of the main drivers. If you actually engage with people's ideas, they are more likely to contribute. You can actually read up on this on Inside Knowledge. So to succeed in crowdsourcing, you need to forget a little bit the crowd. You need to focus to certainly be on all these individuals which compose the crowd and pay attention to them. You have a choice between different kinds of award structures, a flat award structure, what you would see if you hire someone in an Amazon Mechanical Turk. Or you can do this, I spent a lot of my time studying Formula One. 
Um, and in Formula One, you obviously have kind of more tournament kind of setting up incentives, right? The winner takes all. The second Formula One driver is still doing fine. Don't worry about him. But so what you do is you incentivize actually extreme performance. One thing you always need to do is to kill any ambiguity about IP protection, okay? You always, it's, you can do it in multiple ways. The one thing you need to do is that you avoid any ambiguity. It must be clear who owns the idea and who participates in what. If you say like, I'm gonna think about that later, that's a very, very poor strategy. It brings you in problems with your contributors and more important actually with lawyers and the legal department. So we now actually enter the stage of selection. I like this quote by Steve Jobs a lot. People think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good suggestions. It's also a good marriage advice, by the way. <laughs> So one of the problems is how do you actually select, right? Do you use kind of a judgment call? Um, Michelle actually pointed this out about entrepreneurial innovation this morning. She's like, I know it when I see it, right? Um, so this is the same is actually true here, right? The same is actually, you might say, oh, I know a good suggestion when I see it. The problem about it is when BP gets 100,000 suggestions, it's pretty difficult suddenly to see everything, right? You cannot actually look at everything. Ideally, you can actually make up some kind of metric where you could say, all right, we are going to evaluate an algorithm against a specified set of criteria like speed um, or success on another kind of metric. The problem is that's not always functioning, right? What should Starbucks do? How should Starbucks evaluate a drink, right? It seems to be that they use calories if they use any metric, right? The more the better. Um, but it's actually very difficult to define this, right? Length of the product name. Oprah kind of ness, right? <laughs> Oprah, cinnamon, chai, creme, frappuccino. In general, solution-related knowledge can, is much easier to evaluate than problem-related knowledge. What is a good problem you should work on? It's very often the harder question, right? So in this case, if you do not set this up right, BP had more than 100 experts kind of going through all these suggestions and tell me about it, they were a little bit under time pressure at the time. You can use actually the crowd to filter stuff, right? So it's not that Lobo might have a suggestion and I cannot look at all these kind of suggestions. Then I might actually ask Marco, hey Marco, can you have a look at these suggestions? Um, so I actually do not just use members of the crowd, uh, do not just use members of the crowds to generate these ideas, but actually also to select them, right? I could ask them to filter them for me. Right? Very often this is great because the members of the crowd might also be my consumers. Right? So I want to know what they are thinking. If they like an idea, it might be a very good idea. So <coughs> Lego, for example, does that. Lego asks its customers, so Lego asks, can you please submit new designs? And then actually asks its consumers, could you evaluate these kind of designs? Should we build that? And that's obviously a strong indicator of what kind of products are gonna be successful in the future. And you see this, Starbucks goes into the same direction that they actually make people vote on it. This can lead to some pretty big crap actually, <laughs> right? So, th so what they used here, um, what they actually tried was to look for a name for the ship using the crowd, okay? So they come up with Boaty McBoatface, wins the poll name to bow polar research vessel. So very often the crowd is not actually kind of aligned with the interest of the organization, right? If we actually ask the crowd at INSEAD, what should we change at INSEAD, lowering the tuition would always come up on top, mm. right? But that's not necessarily feasible on the best interest, at least not in mine. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing about asking the crowd is, these crowd members might actually attack each other, right? Vikas might have one idea how to where, what the organization should do, and might I might have a to I may have a totally different idea what to do, right? These are not just like hand-holding groups where everyone's like, oh, you know, all innovation is great. They are competing interests. I will say um, research shows that that is actually a good thing to have. If you have a certain amount of conflict, that's actually a positive thing to have. And one of my personal favorite quotes. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of democracy at peace. And what did that produce? <laughs> the cuckoo clock. 
if you have a little bit of conflict in these crowds, that actually just works fine, okay? You might actually do a selection immediately where you say like, we collect all ideas and then we cut it off. You can also have a stage gate process where you go a little bit more through the process basically. Google does this in a very nice way with its current Luna project. The $30 million Google Lunar X Prize is taking us back to the moon for good. To incentivize teams to make the impossible possible, XPRIZE has designed the Milestone Prizes, a series of interim prizes giving teams a boost on their journey towards liftoff. The $6 million in Milestone Prizes are divided into three technical areas. $1 million for developing soft lunar landing technology, $500,000 for movement of 500 meters across a simulated lunar surface, and $250,000 for the production of a mooncast, a high-definition broadcast beamed straight from the moon for all of humanity to see. So what Google does here in a very interesting way is that they use stages, right? So Andy and I, we team up again, and we try to actually develop something together. And if we are successful, then Google actually gives us more resources to do it, right? Because it would not that be easy to launch actually a moon mission for the two of us. Right? So Google actually needs to say, are we somewhat reasonable? And once they figure this out, they actually provide us with incentives. So that's the big advantage of a stage gate process. You can actually go, um, you can actually foster people a little bit more on the way. All right, um, so I want you to remember basically like four words. That's my best hope here. Um, so I'm gonna be a little bit, just follow me. Like we say this once together, define, broadcast, attract, select, all right? Define, broadcast, attract, select. Awesome, thank you so much. So this is actually the overview of all this thing. This is what you're gonna get from me via email unless you have sneaked your way into this without buying a ticket. <laughs> Wait, I could sneak in without a ticket? Yeah, we don't control them at this. <laughs> so the question is, should I do it, right? My students face this question all the time in everyday life, actually when they have Tinder open, should I actually swipe to the left or should I swipe to the right, right? So should you actually do in crowdsourcing? You should actually do crowdsourcing when you do not know who could have the piece of knowledge and you do not know where to hunt for it, right? That was the problem with Colgate. They did not know who to ask. It's not that I don't want to outsource it. We're always kind of discussing strategy discusses, should I make it or should I buy it? That doesn't matter if you do not know who to buy it from or how you could make it. The difficulty is you cannot hunt for knowledge if you don't know where to find it. The real alternative here is to actually go fishing, all right? You just put something out and hope that somebody actually comes to you. So I want to encourage you to go fishing. I've learned at some point that really good, we had this joke in graduate school that good papers can be summarized in one tweet. I've learned from that that I always have to provide my own tweet, basically, all right? <laughs> so at the Inside Entrepreneurship Forum at INSEAD, Pizunka shows innovation fishing via crowdsourcing as a great alternative to knowledge hunting, all right? Go fishing, put it out, and try to engage the crowd to help you to find the idea. Thank you so much.